Um, Charles' mom, Dorothy, um, just found out that she has breast cancer. And uh, but she has made the decision at 81 years old, I'm not fixing it. I'm just, I'm going to go. I'm going to go with it, live with it. Whatever happens, happens. That's her choice, right? That's cool. That's cool. Um, so what I want to do is I want to... I want to join Charles in prayer, family here, and pray for her, just for her comfort and strength through the whole thing. You know, it's going to be tough, so we just want to, we want to be on her side and pray for her. And then also, um, you guys know I don't have TV, so I don't really know exactly what's going on, but I know that um, Wayne and Lena, uh, Wayne has a dear friend named Lee, and I guess his their child passed, fell into a, a well or a sewer or something yeah. of that nature. It's been on the news or something. Whatever the case is, Pretty rough. So um, they asked if we would all join and pray for that family as well. So is there anybody else that'd like to uh, lift up anything else in prayer just so we can? Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. And what do you know what I was going to do? Ken. I'm probably going to forget. Ken. Ken. All right. Gotcha. Um, let's also, um, we'll pray for uh, Amanda's dad. I guess she's doing better, right? Doing better. Yeah. Had a big old nasty heart attack. 100% blockage, you know? So, uh, but doing better. So that's good. That's good. Let's go before the Lord. We'll pray together as a family. Then we'll jump into our Bibles. Um, all consuming fire. Like, I can't get shake that. To look at you would be to perish instantly. Your perfection, your holiness, your splendor, your power, all consuming fire. Yet in your grace, you allow us to come and talk to you. The one who's so grand that he would speak into the nothing and make everything. Yet you let us speak to you because of your son, Jesus. So let us just thank you now as a family of believers we thank you for this grace called Jesus. Lord, I thank you for letting us gather here tonight. I thank you for last weekend, last weekend, the days we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. What a just a tremendous weekend. Um, watching uh, Jimmy be baptized was a great, great time. It was just wonderful to see you working in his life. Being able to go next door and worship on Easter Sunday with the fine folks there at the Presbyterian Church. Be able to come together as a family of believers, a, a, a community of believers. And what's beautiful about the Lord is, is Many of us know that you want unity in the body of Christ, and oftentimes we don't see it. But because of this crazy pastor across the street, because of this wild whim that we had to go join him, two bodies of Christ have grown closer, and now it is their desire to meet with us, to see how we could minister to the city of Eustace together in a more effective way. So we thank you for the stirring of your spirit that encourages us to go do things. Help us to be more obedient to that stir more often. Not to be afraid. So we thank you for that. Uh, Lord, we want to lift up Ken, who's in a car accident. Don't know the details exactly, but obviously there's some broken bones, a lot, of, a, lot of, a lot of stress involved, a lot of family turmoil there, fears and worries, and mortality kicks in, and it's scary, and all those things happen. It's natural. And, but we pray, Lord, that that the comfort of the Holy Spirit of God would rest upon that family and bring them peace. But we also want to thank you for uh, Amanda's dad for the healing that's going on in his body. We thank you that we've had the opportunity to partner with Amanda and her family in praying for him. I know many of us saw the post that we, 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 we uh, gang together and come together to pray. And, and it seems like he's doing well. So we thank you for that. We pray for ongoing blessings upon him and his wife, Amanda, and their whole family. Thank you for that. Lord, we, we lift 
got Dorothy. None of us have ever met her, but man, we're we I know we can't be more thankful to her for bringing us our friend Charles. It's, he's a blessing to this church. He's a dear friend to us all. He's a model of humility before the rest of us. He's one who desires to serve. He's, a, again, a beautiful model for us all to see. He has for your peace and comfort to just rest upon Dorothy. And on Charles. Speak to the storm in their life. And when they're calm, help them get through this. Perhaps you would, you would use this, what we see as tragedy, you would use it to draw them closer to you. Lord, if there's anything that we can do as a family here, to rejoice and thank you for tremendous blessing in our life. Think of the babies that are here. New jobs. New relationships. Beautiful weather. Whatever, we celebrate things. But we also, some of us come in with a, a heavy heart. Hurting. For one reason or another. We may not know that somebody's in pain because we have a posture that says everything's fine, but you know our hearts. You know that we hurt and we need you. Lord, I pray that through the music that we sing, through the words that we hear from your Bible, through giving, through the hug of a fellow revolutionary, through smile, that somehow we know you there. Feel your very presence as we gather here. Holy Spirit, come and teach us. Teach us something about you. Teach us something about ourselves. Let tonight please be a night of massive profit for the kingdom of God. In Jesus' name. Amen. All right. <clears throat> so this, uh, why don't you do me a favor? Um, Turn to Mark chapter 8. It should be up on the screen. If you have a Bible, we're going to go open to Mark chapter 8. If you don't have a Bible and you have a device, you can use that. If you don't have either one and you need a Bible, they're all over the place. Just grab one. Uh, up on the screen will be the page number for the orange and the yellow Bible that you see up there. We're going to read there. That's kind of where we're going to spend most of the time, Mark chapter 8 and Mark chapter 9. Um, it's the next miracle. You know, we talked, we said we, we go over the next set of miracles, you know, whatever comes our way, we're going to do that. So you're going to see it in Matthew that the next miracle is also in Mark. Just kind of chose to read it in Mark. But I um, just kind of want to do something tonight. You know, the, the one thing that, uh, well, I shouldn't say one thing, the main things you see, when you study about Jesus, when you read this Bible, you see that Jesus is just a steady dude. You know, we talked a couple weeks ago that there's really no pattern to the way he heals and blesses. There's no pattern, but he is steady. You know what I'm saying? Like, 
He, he, just, he, was, he was faithful in his ministry. He was faithful to help people. He was faithful to his father to carry through the work that he had been given. He was faithful in praying. You know, he was just a faithful dude. And we like faithful friends, don't you? You want a friend who's faithful to you, someone you can count on all the time. Would you agree? Okay, we all are looking for that. So therefore, if we're all looking for that, then, the true, then, 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 then it's true for everyone else that they are looking of that from you. Did we connect there? Did that make any sense at all? If you're looking for everyone to be faithful, they're looking for you to be faithful. And so what we do is we, if we read the Bible, um, and, and we're learning because, you know, we want to be more like Jesus, right? We want to be more like Jesus. That's the whole point of this thing. That's why we got it, right? So, okay, you, want, you want to pass that along? It's all good. Here we go. Did you hit this side of the room yet? Okay, informal. Informal. For Angel, if you want to sponsor. Um, you can sign it. You can pass it on. Or not sign it. It's all good. You're loved anyway. Um, so here's the thing. We read the scriptures, right? And if you've read the Bible at all, you can see a long list of people that are not faithful. Like I, wouldn't, like I said before, I wouldn't have written the book this way. It would seem to me that you'd write it in a different way. It would make it seem good, right? But, but that's just not the way it is all the time. You see a long history of inconsistency uh, of people that are not faithful. You know, in their worship, they're not faithful. In their generosity, they're not faithful. To their friends, they're not faithful. Not faithful, not faithful, not faithful. Well, we're supposed to be like Jesus. But listen, when you read the Bible, I don't want you to be discouraged and say, well, it's hopeless, nothing will ever change. But I also don't want to encourage you to be unfaithful because everyone in the Bible is unfaithful. If they can do it, then you can do it. So we're trying to find out how we can be more like, not like the way we are and not like the people in the Bible. We're supposed to be more like who? Like Jesus, who's very steadfast and faithful. And, and, and so we want to we be like him. And so what I want to do is I want to spend some time shining light on, on a very common darkness. Okay, on a very common darkness. And I think you'll see it's prevalent through the room, so you're going to see that it's in you too. I think, I think that ev this applies to every single person, including the guy talking. Okay, including the guy talking. Um, let's read in Mark chapter 8, just the first couple of verses. Here, let's start in Mark 8, uh, chap chapter 8, verse 1. And you're gonna see, this is what it says. Um, about this time. Now, there's stuff like that all through the Bible. Everything Jesus did. And then, and about this time, and, and then they did this, and then they did that. But there's no, there's no calendar there. There's no exact date or time of the day. It's just you do something, and then he did something else, and he did something else. So time-wise, we don't exactly know exactly how long between the last thing and the next thing. Okay, But it's just, and then. Okay, and then. Uh, about this time, another large group, a lot of large crowd, had gathered, and the people ran out of food again. Do you remember what he's referring to? Do you guys remember, just uh, in Matthew, it's, where, it's, it's one chapter before this, there's 5,000 people with no food. One chapter. Now, now, I love this, where it says about this time, and, and then, and later on, when it says something like that, the Bible just says that, like these very vague statements of time. There's no exact time laid out. I don't know the time between uh, Matthew chapter 14 and Matthew chapter 15 and Matthew chapter 15 and Matthew chapter 16. It's, it doesn't tell you exactly how much time. But you know what? Jesus' ministry was only three years. That's as long as this little church has been going. That's how long Jesus' ministry was. So you know one thing. If it's only been going three years, and it's only one chapter apart, it couldn't have been very long. Would you all agree? Okay, not very long. Okay. About this time, another large crowd had gathered, and the people ran out of food again, just like they had just a few paragraphs before Jesus called his disciples and told them, I feel sorry for these people. They have been here with me for three days and they have nothing left to eat. If I send them home hungry, they will faint 
along the way. For some of them have come a long distance. Matthew, same thing. If we don't feed them, they'll get tired along the way. They will grow faint along the way. And I think that this is not just uh, another story. It's a powerful story because it speaks of our weakness. We're just like them along the way. They had just watched Jesus feed 5,000 men plus their wives and their kids. So would you venture to say seven, eight, nine, ten thousand 10,000 people? They had run out of food, and Jesus, this amazing Savior, this amazing God-man, had multiplied five loaves of bread and two fish into feeding this multitude of people that covered a hillside. That is a tremendous miracle. Incredible, right? Incredible. And what happens? One chapter later. One. One chapter later, these same disciples who witnessed this amazing miracle, yet again, here they are going, well, where are we going to get food? Duh. But you know, before we make fun of them, aren't we the same way? We are absolutely, everyone in this room, including me, is the exact same way. He does something for us, every one of us. If I was the pastor on a clipboard right now, you could tell me, you could list all the things that Jesus has done for you, those supernatural things that you can't explain. And then he did this, and then he did that. You all have them, right? Tell me who has them. Every single one of us, right? Every single one of us. Yet, as soon as something happens, <gasps> one chapter later, the same exact situation. And this is the story here. It says, along the way. Just a big picture of his life. He's going along. Right? He's going along. Just like these folks. Jesus does something amazing. He delivers you. And you're like, praise God. And then, just going along in life. Just moving along in life. And all of a sudden, what happens? Confidence fades. Trust in him fades. The belief in him fades. See, I, I believe that you did. This, this is us. I believe that you did, but I'm not quite sure that you will do. I mean, that's everyone in this room. Come on. Right? Everyone. I believe that you did, but I'm not quite sure that you will do it. Everyone in here and everyone who visits a church on Saturday or Sunday will say the same thing. And if they don't, they're alive. Everyone. I believe that you did. See, these people, they believe that he, can, that he did stuff. I mean, they were right there. They were part of it, right? They sat on the grassy knoll on the, on the, on the hillside. They watched Jesus say the prayer. And it actually, he handed them the food, and they actually distributed. They were part. They didn't just watch from the sidelines. They were active participants in the miracle. And just one chapter later, we're going to get food. Their confidence begins to fade, and I think that we're just the exact same. There's not a single person that's different. See, I think one of the problems that we have in, in church, I, I know that I, I can speak of this church. I'm a huge Bible. I love the Bible. If you guys haven't already figured out, I love the Bible. It's the only thing I can do. Okay? I love reading the Bible. I love reading the stories of what Jesus Christ has done. I believe that, that Jesus is God. I believe that he's the son of God. I believe that he is God. I believe that he's the word that became flesh. I believe that in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God and he put on skin and dwelt among us. I believe that he opened the Red Sea. I believe that he burned inside a bush, yet the bush did not burn. I believe he spoke to the water and it calmed. I believe he walked upon the water. I believe he mass produced food out of a happy meal. I believe that he spoke to the leper and healed him. I believe that he touched the blind and healed him. I believe that the paralyzed would stand Stand up and walk. I believe all these things. I believe that he actually saved me. But my circumstances now. See, I believe that he did. But I'm not quite sure that he'll do. Guilty as charged. Everyone in here. And this is what he wants to encourage you with. See, what the problem is is that we read about what he did. Now, scholars can argue when Moses roamed the earth. They can argue when Noah was here and Abraham and, 
They'll fight over how old the Earth, the earth is. It's 5,000 years, it's 6,000, it's 30 million years. What about the dinosaurs? Who cares? I mean, it doesn't make any difference. I don't know. I wasn't there. Who was there? I don't know. I wasn't there. It doesn't make any difference. But see, here we, we read this stuff, and it's awesome because we see what Jesus did. But what we don't focus on most of the time is what Jesus is doing. We, we look at the Red Sea, and we say, wow, that's amazing. Yet we look at the fact that Jimmy H. and gives his life to Christ and is a new man, and we just clap. And that's no big deal. Why wouldn't that make the history books? Do you know that not a single person is seeking God? Nobody wants, nobody wants God. They want to just do whatever they want to have fun. Stand is fun, isn't it? It's fun. It's fun. All the people that are going, I'm not quite sure right now in case someone's looking right, right? But it's true, right? It's in fun. Nobody wants this. They don't want to come to church. They don't want to give 10% of their income to some dude that they can't see and hope for eternity. That's what they think out there. They have no assurance of salvation. They don't feel the confidence that you do. They're out there just running around like crazy. They don't want this. Nobody wants it. So when someone does, it's insane. That's insane. And we need to rejoice in that. But we're like that. We get so caught up in the circumstances of our life that we can't believe that Jesus would do exactly what he did before. I've come up here and I've just gushed about the crazy stuff that Jesus has done in my life. You, you all know it. And I'm not going to bore you. But it's insane. I love the Bible. I love what, what, what God did with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Noah and Paul and David and Solomon, all these great, great men of the Bible and all these great stories. And man, it's crazy, right? They make movies about this stuff. Who's making a movie about Jimmy? Like it's no big deal. How life changed for eternity. That's insane. That's insane. We're so, so guilty of this. And I think that we need to rejoice often about the things that God is doing in your life now. That's why we've encouraged you, we've, we've incorporated this, this piece of paper into uh, our weekly gathering. Because you, we, we often will sing and pray and go home and hope for the best. Guilty as charged again. When all the while, do you remember the skit that they did last week? Do you remember Jesus out there going, I want to talk to you. I want to open your Red Sea now. If you just shut up and listen. He's doing the same stuff now as he did back then. If we would just listen. I want to invite you to another section of scripture. My gift to you tonight is an extremely short message. <laughs> I'm almost done. <laughs> Praise God, man. It's good to be loved. Do me a favor and look over in Mark chapter 9. So I'm reading through the miracles and I'm just seeing this pattern and I'm like, man, these people are pathetic and these people are just like me. So if I look over in Mark chapter 9, look over... Um, if you will, uh, this, this other miracle. This is Jesus, it says, it's, it's labeled, Jesus heals this demon-possessed boy. Uh, can I read this with you guys? Would that be cool? Are you all there? I just want you to be more like Jesus. That's the thing. You know, uh, think about this. When we, none of us really would ever say that we don't trust Jesus to deliver us. I mean, we wouldn't publicly stand up Put your microphone on and say, you know what? I can't trust Jesus in this. Like, we don't do that. No one would dare do that. But what does our fears say? What's our constant worry about how we're going to get through something say, not only to Jesus, but to the people who are watching you? What does it say? Let's be honest. We're, everyone in this room knows everybody here right now. So what is it? We don't have to hide it. We're a family of believers here, okay? This is no evangelistic sermon. This is a family of believers gathering. What does it say when you fear and worry when it's on display? Because I'm guilty of it. What does it say? 
that we can't trust this Jesus we proclaim to be God. If, if listen, let's just, let's just nuts and bolts this, okay, for a moment. If the one you love and believe in, and you're trying to preach it to other people, like they're going to believe you and want that, if that one is supposedly, well, we're the Christians, so we believe some, but to them it's supposedly. If supposedly he's the one who spoke creation into existence, and he's the one who multiplied the food for thousands of people, and he's the one who walked across the water, and he's the one who spoke to the storm and it stopped, like if he's supposedly that dude, should we ever display fear and worry? And if we do, that's why they're not here. Right? Myself included. I'm a stress bag. Y'all know it. I walk around frantic and freaking out if there's a chair out of place. Yeah. Murata. <laughs> it does it on purpose. I see it. Fix it. Fix it. Fix it. Fix it. Right? We worry about stuff, right? Well, who, if, if we've got this, this big brother, Jesus, right, who's the creator of all heaven and earth, why in the world would we worry about fill in the blank? Anything. Perfect love, this book says, this book says that perfect love expels all fear. So why would we worry about anything? Who, who here has ever worried about something? Who, who ever felt like they were the end of the rope? Keep your hand up, right? Are you still here? So then you were wrong. So why do we keep doing it? Dog to the pew, dog to the pew, dog to the pew, dog to the pew. Right? It's true, right, though? That's what we do. Every one of us, dog to the pew, dog to the pew, return to the pew, return to the pew, all the time. Why? Like, I'm asking you questions, and you can't just turn it on, right? Okay, I'm not going to worry about anything anymore. That would be nice. I'm not, in a minute, God's going to get up with a magic wand from the stage. He's going to wave it over you, and no one's going to worry anymore. You ready? That would be nice. It's just not going to happen. It's not going to happen. Hey, guys. It's not going to happen. Oh, but, but listen, we can, make a, we can make a better choice. Life's about choices, right? We can choose. We can choose not to worry. We can choose to, to go to God and ask Him to strengthen us and help us. We can choose to pray instead of worry. We can choose that. We don't have to do it, but we can choose it. The Bible says to do it, so why not just do it? And when you, when you pray, when you pray, and you thank Him for all that He's given you, and, and you ask Him for the things that you need, what does the Bible promise? It says that the peace that surpasses all understanding will, will, will cover you as you live in Christ. That, that's a promise of God that is not exercised quite enough. I just want to commend that to you, that you use it. Um, let's look here at Matt, in Mark chapter 9. This kid, uh, demon-possessed boy, and, and here's Jesus again, just consistently um, uh, ministering. Like, not, he's not someone who you can't rely on. You know what I'm saying? Like, he's steadfast in his ministry, and we, we need to be that way. So, tirelessly uh, blessing and helping. Uh, when they returned to the, to the other disciples, so a couple of them had gone off, three of his disciples with Jesus up on this mountain where he changes color, you know, like, gun hammer stuff, you know, like superhero stuff, right? And so he's up there, and they come down off of the mountain, this Peter, James, and John with Jesus, and when they get back there, all of his other disciples are still hanging out there, and this crowd has gathered around them because they know about Jesus, and they want to get close to Jesus with all their sick and all their problems, and they want to be healed, we all want to be healed. So they gather up, up around these disciples, and it says that they saw a large crowd surrounding the rest of the disciples, and some teachers of religious law, these religious folks, they were arguing with the disciples. When the crowd saw Jesus, however, they were overwhelmed with awe, and they ran to greet him. I just kind of want a side note here, that when, when people see the genuine article, they will be in awe, and they will flock to it. You, you'll see here that these disciples will, will not be able to do all that Jesus was able to do. You'll see their failure here in a moment. But when the real deal shows up on the scene, people are in awe of the real deal, and they come to it. They flock to it. And so I encourage you to be that real deal. When the crowd saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed with awe, and they ran to greet him. What is all this arguing about, Jesus asks. One of the men in the crowd spoke.
spoke up and said, Teacher, I brought my son so you could heal him. He is possessed by an evil spirit that won't let him talk. And whenever this spirit seizes him, it throws him violently to the ground. And he foams at the mouth, grinds his teeth, becomes rigid, kind of like a, a seizure, if you will. Okay? Kind of like a seizure. Many of us have seen people go into seizures where they start doing just this. You've got to kind of put a spoon in their mouth. You know what I'm talking about. Okay, so, so I asked your disciples to cast out the evil spirit, but they couldn't do it. And Jesus goes on here. This is kind of a time to be honest with you. Maybe some of you think that when someone's a pastor that they have it all figured out. I mean, tell you right now, I don't have this next section figured out. It's kind of a rough section of, of scripture for me. But he, Jesus kind of, it almost seems like he's kind of upset with them. He says, you faithless people, how long must I be with you? How long must I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. Now, some of you already have it figured out. You go, well, what's wrong with you, Moses? Why don't you figure it out? I can have a deep conviction about something from my spot out of my mouth. And so I don't have a deep conviction about what, where Jesus' heart was in this matter. But I want to read on to get to the part we're going to focus on. So they brought the, so they brought the boy. But when the evil spirit saw Jesus, he it threw the child into a violent convulsion, and he fell to the ground, writhing and foaming at the mouth. You can see the scene, if you will. Use your imagination and see the scene of what's going on here. Before Jesus' feet, before this whole crowd of people, there's a ton of people there, thousands of people, watching this all go down before the feet of this miracle worker. They want to see what's going to happen, right? We all want to see what's going to happen. And she says, how long has this been happening? And I think that's a loaded question. He knows how long it's been happening. He's going to prove to the people how awesome he is because it's been happening a long time. See, if it just started happening, not a big deal. But a long history of, of this, if he heals that, it's more impressive, right? So being the show off that Jesus is and deserves to be, the man replies, since he was a little boy. So it's been going on for some time. The spirit often throws him into the fire or into water trying to kill him. Have mercy on us and help us if you can. Does anyone know what we're going to talk about? Yeah. <laughs> Aren't you like that? I'm sad to say it right now. I like that. Help me if you can. What is Jesus? I love Jesus. Why? If I can. What you talking about, Vince? <laughs> you know? What do you mean if I can? Do you know who I am? You didn't, you didn't read the last chapter. You didn't see me walking across that little lake over there that I made by the way? You didn't see that. What do you mean if I can? us. I believe that you did. I'm not sure that you will do. True that? Everyone. What do you mean? What do you mean if I can? Jesus asked anything that is possible if a person believes. And then here's us right here. The Father instantly cries out, I do believe, but help me overcome my unbelief. That's us right there in a nutshell. So that's the thing that Jesus wants to confront everyone here right now. You do believe. You, you, you've read the stories. You've read the stories, haven't you? you you've, had him, you've had him write stories in your life. You can write a book. You believe it because it's happened. Yet, much like that guy right then and there. See, I see what you've done, but in, in this situation, I'm just not sure that you can do this. That's not, that's not God. That's not the God you serve. That's not the God you serve. See, all of us, again, I want to encourage you, all of us have a long list of proof that Jesus can. We, we believe that, that Jesus is the Son of God. We, we believe because we... We've been taught, we've read, we've seen the movies of Jesus going up on the cross to, to pay for your sin so that you can have forever. We believe all those things. We believe that he healed the lepers and the blind folks. We believe all of that stuff because, you know why, let's be honest here, Christians, 
It's really easy to believe it because it's in the book and you can't prove it wrong. So it's kind of easy because there's no jeopardy there. There's no, there's no cost to believing it. No one's going to put a gun to your head for believing it. You can believe it because you can't prove it wrong. True? You can't prove it wrong. No one can prove right now that I'm not going to be with Jesus in heaven after I'm dead and he comes back to get me. I, I, you can't prove it because you're not there, right? So it's safe for me to say, I believe in Jesus as the Son of God and he took away my sins so I could be with him forever. He gave me life, I gave him my death and I'm going to be in glory forever. It's easy for us to believe that because no one can prove it wrong. And see, unfortunately for us, salvation, the fruit of salvation, is viewed as some future event. And so it's easy to believe that we're going to get there because nobody can prove it wrong. But in our situation right now, whatever situation you're in right now, it's very, very hard to believe. It's true. I'm right there with you. I'm mortal man. I'm, it's hard for me to believe that he can do these things. I can't wave a magic wand for you. But what I can do is ask you to go back and revisit often those tremendous times of, of fear and worry in your life when you felt like nothing could work and all of a sudden, bam, he helped you and you've been delivered. See, salvation is not just for eternity in heaven. Salvation is simply this. The synonym for it is deliverance. You've been delivered. How many times have you been delivered? How many times have you fallen at the knees of Jesus and begged him to help you when he came through? So why, why, why do you not trust him now? Why? That, now we can rip on this guy. When I, when I read the line, we all kind of giggled. I heard it through the group. And it's us. That's us. Be encouraged you're not alone, but also be encouraged that you can do better. You can do better. We read and we study about what Jesus did, and we can believe it. But is God dead? I think I'll make a movie about that. Oh, to make some money. Is God dead? Did he, did he speak creation into existence and then shows, like, for, for like a couple thousand years, he just shows off. Like, look how awesome I am. And then he took off. Is that the way it is? Why do we live like it? We live like it. We live like it because we don't trust him to do these tremendous things like he did before. We can study about what Jesus did in the past, but we don't study what Jesus is doing now. Just, I, I wish, I don't know where Jimmy and Mandy are, but just ask them if Jesus is still alive. Ask them if Jesus is still changing lives. Ask Sydney if people, if people are being changed by God. Ask Kyle if people are being changed by God. Ask Jared if God is still changing people. Just ask them. Ask Charles if God is still changing people. Ask my wife and ask if God is still changing people. He's alive. He's alive. It, he's, he's alive and well in the people of God. And, and we need to shout from the rooftops all that he's doing so people would know that they can trust him. They can know that he can trust him. I want, to, I want you to do me a favor. It's a little bit strange. I want you to make yourself comfortable. In case you're wondering if God is still alive, if you're wondering if God is still active in the lives of people here on this earth now, 2,000 years later, after he walked on water, after he healed, after he, he went to the, to the paralyzed and said, stand up, pick up your mat and walk. And we're like, oh, awesome. But we, we can rejoice and we can believe in all that stuff because we see that it happen. It's in the book, right? We see it. I want to encourage you. What the people in this world need is they need to know what God's doing now. I would venture to say, and you guys can tell me if I'm wrong, but I would venture to say that if you're like 15 years old or older in this country, you probably have heard the story of Noah. Jesus. Moses, Ten Commandments, Burning Bush, Red Sea. You've, you've heard this stuff, right? But 
most people have heard it. Would you agree? Maybe they haven't gone with a you know an intentional discipleship program, but they've heard it. But you know what they haven't heard? What God's doing right now. So they can have hope. Watch this and have hope. Okay? Watch this.
another thing I had in my head was like, oh, people come to church when they're sick and they want to be saved. And, and when it's Christmas, they come and I'm thinking, I don't wonder if those pretend so. And then I said, you know what? I'm always trying to reason not to go about it. And, you know, by that time, I had stopped doing drugs and drinking. It's been four years now, so. Jesus was that, that loved me all the time. And even when I was sinning, and I come to church and I found out he loves everybody. You know, he, everybody's his kids and, and he loves them no matter what they do. Just like with my son and my daughter did anything wrong, I love them. I'm not going to disown them or anything like that. Right. So, what's your relationship with your Bible now? You, you used to not read it all, it didn't make any sense. Going to school, uh, school work was difficult, and you couldn't really make sense of it all. And then you had something, I know something changed inside of you. There's a relationship with God in the Bible and you're reading. You can explain yeah. that a little bit. Yeah, I eventually listened to you preach. As we sing through this song, I just want to invite you guys to either bow your heads and just let the words of this song sink in. Or just watch the lyrics as they go by and scream above you. And just let these words just guide you to, to a closer relationship with God. This is a powerful song. And when we get to the bigger part of the song, I'm going to ask you all to stand with us in reverence to God and just worship Him and just sing out to Him and give Him everything that we've got. So let's do that. Now.